Well, right now, a secret air base for unmanned aerial vehicles, we call them drones, most people don't, most people call them UAVs. Uh, this is apparently this base operated by the CIA in Saudi Arabia, and this was first revealed uh, by the New York Times today, a few other reports in, in a few previous years have come up about this base, but the Times reporting today that drones at the base are being used in the hunt for high-value targets in Yemen, including the strike that killed the American-born al-Qaeda operative Anwar al-Awlaki. Jonathan Shamser is the Vice President of Research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. And Jonathan, you spent a, a great deal of time in your career uh, looking at our relationship with Saudi Arabia. And that's what stood out to us about this report today, not so much the policy about the drones, but also about where we're putting the bases. What do you what do you think this says about our relationship with the Saudis and how reliable they are as partners in our war on terror? Well, Jenna, it's a great question, and, and I have to say that the U.S.-Saudi relationship is probably among uh, the more dysfunctional relationships that I've had the pleasure of trying to analyze. Uh, on the one hand, you've got the United States that is funding both sides in the war on terror uh, by purchasing Saudi oil and, and oil from the rest of the Gulf. We're funding both sides in the war on terror, and now we find out that the Saudis are on the one hand radicalizing uh, people in the Middle East uh, and financing terrorism on the one hand, and then on the other hand, housing a base for the CIA to go hunting high-value targets in places like Yemen and beyond. So you can scratch your head on this one, but uh, you know, try to make sense of it. I don't know. So is this a good idea? Well, certainly it's a good idea in the sense that it's a forward base. Uh, we're going to be more able to go after uh, some of these terrorists that are in places like uh, Yemen or in the Horn of Africa or anywhere else in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, for that matter. But, you know, I think the, the broader question about drones is, you know, is that, sh should that be our strategy? Are we looking at the state sponsors? Are we trying to cut off uh, the funding and the radicalization at the source? Or are we only going after those who are really the most uh, obviously uh, – the most obvious targets who are out there uh, carrying out terrorist attacks. You know, attacks. and that's the thing that you've looked at recently. It looked at social networking within Saudi Arabia and to get an idea of what, what is the tone out there and the temperament and, and what's happening in that specific country that also spreads outward. And you talked about, you know, uh, who's radicalized, how bad are they, what kind of enemies are we facing out there. In your, in your study, in your research, do you think these, these drone attacks have been effective to deter people uh, from becoming more radicalized, or are they being used as propaganda to bring people to, to the side of our enemies? Well, I mean, what we found in our study was that uh, radicalism is alive and well inside Saudi Arabia, that clerics are propagating hatred online, and that we, uh, our study was called Facebook Fatwa, and the, and the bottom line is, is that in 140 characters, uh, clerics can radicalize Saudis uh, and or perhaps even the entire Middle East uh, on issues like what we're just seeing right now. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing on the, you know, on the blogs, on Twitter at the moment, it's actually very subdued, and I think for a very good reason, the Saudis have uh, really informed forced an environment where people will self-censor. They don't want to test the Saudis. They're not sure how, how much the Saudis will tolerate uh, people challenging the regime over their decision to work with the CIA. So things are quiet now, but I would expect within the next week or so that we'll see people begin to chime in. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see whether uh, a, a movement mounts. Yeah, very very curious. And I trust you, since you're the one out of the two of us that speaks and reads Arabic, I'll, I'll leave that to you to let us know what, what you see over the next couple of days. Just a quick final question. For, for you, Jonathan, because we have to look at the region as a whole. And the drone base was first discovered in Saudi Arabia around 2009, uh, 2011. That's when the construction seemed to be complete. That's also where we've seen the Arab Spring. We've seen a lot of different partnerships happen. And just recently, a historic event in Egypt, just yesterday, the Iranian president is there hanging out with the new Egyptian president. How are you seeing these partnerships? You know, again, we're looking at the drone campaign and how we're trying to win the war on terror. What about these new partnerships that are emerging, emerging as well? Well, I mean, this visit by Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to Egypt for the Organization of Islamic Cooperation is, is a really troubling uh, scenario here. I mean, the, the Egyptians and Iranians have not had a meeting like this in decades. Uh, the implication here is that Morsi is, is more open to talking to Ahmadinejad, that Ahmadinejad and the Iranians view the new Egypt as uh, less of a friend to uh, the United States, less of a friend to Israel, and it's for that reason that he was willing to go over there. Now, of course, there was one 
incident where somebody was trying to go after Ahmadinejad with a shoe, but I think the broader um, sort of observation that I would make is that he was really being widely cheered by many in Egypt. Mm. First time in 30 years, right, that the Iranian president on Egyptian soil, so that's why we wanted to make sure we pointed that out to our viewers as well. Jonathan, great to see you as always. Thank you so much. Pleasure.